That's how I ask questions. Yep. All right, just loading. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the CDR Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski and I'll be your host for today. We're always excited every year when February rolls along. Every February, we kick all the men out for the month and we host exclusively uh, women in science, adventure, exploration and conservation from all over the world. It's been a crazy busy month so far. I think we've had about 30 live events so far. We've probably got maybe 15 to 20 left to round out uh, the rest of February. So still a lot more fun uh, to come. Really excited to be continuing along today with Kristen Lear joining us. She is a bat conservationist and environmental educator. She got her start in bat conservation when she was 12. She built and installed bat houses for her Girl Scout Silver Award project. Since then, she's traveled the world, including the United States, Australia, and Mexico, to learn about bats, to learn about how to protect endangered bats, and to share her passion with the public. So we have uh, Kristen joining us live from Georgia today. Kristen, it's so great to see you again. Uh, lots of great classrooms from Canada and the U.S. tuning in, and we are looking forward to getting to know you a little better today. Awesome. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to talk bats. Uh, like Joe mentioned, I am a bat conservation scientist, and I have been working with bats officially for about 12 years now since college, but I actually got my start in uh, sixth grade when I was 12 years old. So I'm going to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint, um, lots of pictures about my journey in bat conservation and how you all can help bats too. And at the end, we'll have lots of time for questions. So if you think of questions, just keep them up in your head or write them down and we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Okay, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Let's see. Can you all see? Let's see where we go. Okay, can you all see it yet? It might be coming up. It's loading, there we go. Okay, awesome. Let me get the slideshow started. Okay. Is that working for everyone? We got it, nice and full screen. Awesome. So like I mentioned, um, my name is Kristen Lear and I am a bat conservationist. And um, I'm excited to talk to you about bats because I think they're the coolest animals in the world and I absolutely love working with them. Uh, as a bat conservation scientist, I get to see some really cool bats all around the world. So this is Bracken Cave in Texas and it is the largest colony of any mammal in the entire world with over, or over 15 million Mexican free bats. So this is a huge colony of bats and getting to sit under and study these bats is one of the things that I get to do as a bat conservation scientist. I also get to study pollinating bats. So these are bats that eat the nectar from flowers and they pollinate plants like agave plants and banana plants and so I actually get to use some cool infrared spy technology to watch the bats feeding at night on these flowers. I get to crawl through some really fun caves, um, some really tight spaces to look for bats and where they're roosting. And as bat conservation scientists, we get to discover new caves and discover where bats are living. And these little bats here are a critically endangered species, which means they're almost extinct. And so as bat conservationists, we work to protect these bats all over the world. And one of my favorite parts of the job is getting to actually catch bats so that we can study them. When we catch bats, we can learn all about how healthy they are, how many bats are in an area, and this tells us how bat populations are doing. So I also love to get to see the bats up close because there, there's so many different types of bats and they're all very cool. So being a bat conservationist takes you all over the world because bats are found everywhere all over the world except for Antarctica. So you can study bats anywhere. But I did not get started in bat conservation and in science when I was an adult. I started when I was really, really little, when I was a toddler. I loved to go out and explore. I loved to dig in the dirt and climb trees and look for animals. And that's what got me interested in, in science and studying nature. And then when I was in Girl Scouts all the way from kindergarten through high school, uh, my Girl Scout troop and I would take night hikes and we would walk around the woods at night listening for the bats echolocating in the sky. And that's when I 
discovered that I loved bats. And I thought I wanted to do something to help them. So in sixth grade, like I mentioned, I built and put up bat houses for my Girl Scout Silver Award project. And this is me uh, with my dad building some bat houses and we put them up in a local park in Cincinnati, Ohio, where I'm from. Um, and I was super excited. I was really proud that I had built these bat houses. I had never used power tools before, um, but I got to use them. And I was super excited to, to actually start working with bat conservation. And so after that, I decided that I wanted to learn all that I could about bats. So I started, started researching and reading about all the different types of bats in the world. This is just a few of the bats. Um, you can see a huge diversity of species and how they look. Um, we have the little white bats up the top left um, that make tents in leaves and they look like little marshmallows or little cotton balls. Then we have some of the flying foxes, the one in the top middle and the bottom left um, that eat fruit and they have big eyes because they, they look for their fruit instead of eating insects. And then we have the top right, one of the vampire bat species. There's only three vampire bat species in the world. Um, and this is one of the ones that live in Mexico and, and South uh, America. And then we have the bulldog bat in the bottom middle. And they have these really big noses that they use to make really loud calls to attract mates. And then one of my favorites on the bottom right is what we call the Yoda bat. Because it kind of looks like Yoda, doesn't it? With those little nose, that little tube nose. But these are just some of the bats. And there are 1,406 species right now, there actually might be more today, um, that we know of in the world. And one in every five mammal species is a bat. So there's lots of different bats around the world. And when I was doing my research after uh, building the bat houses, I learned that bats are mammals. They have fur, they give birth to live young, just like we do. So they are just like cats, dogs, and people, they're mammals. And one of the really cool things that I learned was that they actually fly with their hands. So can you see this picture here? This is their hand and we can see their thumb, first finger, second finger, third finger, and then pinky. So they actually fly with really, really long fingers and a membrane between them. So if you had long fingers like a bat to fly, your fingers would be about four feet long. That's pretty long, isn't it? And like I said, I learned that bats are all over the world except for Antarctica. So you can study bats as a bat scientist pretty much anywhere you want. And I learned that bats are superheroes. Bats have several different superpowers that I think are really cool and that actually help us. So one of the, their superpowers is that some bats have really, really long tongues. Can y'all see that pink thing coming out of its mouth in the tube? That's its tongue. And some bats, their tongue is one and a half times their body length. So that would be like if you had a tongue and you were standing up, your tongue would be about up to here when you were standing. And they use those really, really long tongues to reach into the flowers to get nectar. And when they do that, they get covered in pollen and then they spread that pollen to other plants. So they help pollinate things like bananas, mangoes, cashews, and my favorite, cacao, which we use to make chocolate. Who likes chocolate? Anyone like chocolate? Raise your hand, I see, yeah. Without bats, we wouldn't have chocolate. We wouldn't have bananas. So we can thank a bat for their superpower of pollination. And they also have another superpower of seed dispersal. So which means they spread seeds all over the place and help regrow plants. A lot of bat species eat things like fruit, and when they eat the fruit, they eat the pulp, and then they spit out the rest of the plant, and they spit out the seeds. And that helps regrow things like tropical rainforests. So without bats, we wouldn't have tropical rainforests. And the third superpower of bats, which is one of my favorite, is that they control pest insects. So the majority of bat species around the world eat insects things like moths and beetles and mosquitoes. So they help control these insect populations. And their really cool superpower is that one bat can eat up to its body weight in insects every night during the summer. So if you had to eat enough quarter pounder hamburgers to be like a bat in one night, how many hamburgers would you have to eat? I won't make you do the math, but 
you would have to eat between 200 to 600 or more hamburgers every night to be like a bat. You can imagine that's a lot of food. And a lot of that is things like pest insects, like mosquitoes. So we can thank bats for helping get rid of some of the mosquitoes around our houses. But I learned that even superheroes sometimes need our help. Unfortunately, bats are losing their habitat. Um, you know, we clear trees, we're disturbing their caves where they live. Sometimes people do kill bats and they, there's also a lot of diseases that can, can hurt bats and kill them. So that's what we do as bat conservation scientists is we study how to help protect them. And that's a big part of my job. But one of my favorite parts of my job is actually doing conservation work to help protect them and helping other people do that too. So one of the things that you can do, everyone can do this, is building and putting up a bat house like I did in sixth grade. So these bat houses provide a home for the bats where they can sleep during the day and it's safe for them. And anyone can do this. So this is a kindergarten class from where I'm from in Ohio. They built bat houses at their school and put them up at their school. I've helped Girl Scout troops and Boy Scout troops with bat house building and other groups, other kids, anyone can do this. And it's a really fun activity to help the bats. And this is what you get. When you get a lot of bats, these bats love these houses and they go in there and then they're eating all the mosquitoes around your area. So it's a great thing to do and it's, it helps the bats and it helps you. And as a bat conservation scientist, we also get to use some really cool equipment. Um, the, this video is an infrared camera that can see in the pitch black at night, and we can see the bats coming out of the bat house for the evening to go hunt the insects. Uh, we also get to use things like thermal cameras that pick up the body heat of the bats. And you can see the bats landing in the morning and crawling up into the bat house to go to sleep for the day. And we can peek up inside the bat houses. So this is looking up inside the bat house. And you can see they're, they're in there, they're really tightly packed because they like to be close to together and close to each other to keep warm. And we can use infrared scopes on a little camera on a pole to look up inside and see the bats up in there sleeping. And they actually socialize a lot during the day too. Another thing that you can do is plant a bat garden in your yard or your school. So planting a bat garden would be planting flowers that bloom at night and that attract nocturnal insects, things like moths, that the bats can then come and eat. So you'd have your own little ecosystem in your yard and you'd be providing a, a food banquet for the bat, for the bats. You can also adopt a bat from a bat organization. Um, two organizations that I love and recommend are Bat Conservation International and Bat World Sanctuary that actually have um, adoption kits where you support um, a bat species or an individual bat that's in the care of the organization. And with your donation, you're supporting those bats. And it's a really great thing to do. I did that in, I think, third grade with a puffin through a zoo, and it was a, a fun thing to do as a class. And one of the easiest things that everyone can do is tell your friends and family how neat bats are and just how important they are to have around. Anyone can talk about bats and if, if we spread the word of how good they are, then even more people will like them and want to protect them. And remember, no matter what your interest or your passion is, it really is never too early to get started. So with that, I want to start or stop sharing my screen and I have a few things to show you all. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And then before we go to question and answer, I would like to show a bat house. So this is one of the bat houses. Um, it's a demo, so it's not painted yet, but you can see inside, can you all see this? So this is what it looks like and it's cut out <clears throat> so we can see the inside right here. So what the bats do is they land on right here, this part, and then they crawl up inside. And then there's different chambers or different rooms where the bats can go and sleep. And this house here can hold about 200 bats. So it's not very big, but the, like I said, the bats love to be really close together. And so they actually like these really tight spaces. And these are really easy to put together. So anyone can do it. Um, they have kits online that are really easy to, to build. And then 
one more thing before we do question time is I have some bat specimens. So these are real bats that are in museums now. They, they're not alive anymore, but they used to be. And these are some different species that are pretty common here in the US. So can you all see this one? This is a big brown bat. And when I say big brown, you can see that they're not actually that big. They're a couple inches long. And like we showed before, these are their fingers up here, their finger bones. And this is their arm right here. And then they have their wing membrane. All of this, this kind of tissue paper substance is, is their membrane that they fly with. And this is their tail. And they have five little toes on their feet, just like we do. You can see the little toes. And they're, they're covered in fur. They're really soft, um, just like kind of mice, um, rats, the very soft fur. And I'll show you this one here. Is it a red bat? You can see this one is more red than the brown bat. And it has a lot of fur on its tail. You can see the tail has a lot more fur than this one here. And that's because these red bats actually roost in the, the leaves outside in the trees. They don't roost inside caves or buildings. And so they have to have a lot more fur to stay warm. And so that's why this one's a lot furrier than this one. And then one more bat, which I think is one of the coolest bats we have here in the US. This is called the Mexican free-tailed bat. And you can see its tail sticks out. Can you see that? So the tail is sticking out there. And that's why it's called a free tail. And these are the fastest animal flyers in the entire world in straight flight. So peregrine falcons, which is a bird, a raptor, can, can dive the fastest in the air. But these bats can fly the fastest in straight flight. And they can fly up to 100 miles an hour. This little tiny bat, that's faster than we go on the highway in our cars. So these are pretty amazing animals. Um, they, these ones eat, all the ones I've showed eat insects, things like beetles, moths, and mosquitoes. So we love having these bats around. And with that, I'd like to take any questions and I guess we can unmute everyone. Thank you. All right, sounds good. Well, Kristen, thanks so much for sharing. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, and I think, you know, for some students out there who might not have been sure about bats, I think you might have convinced them that they play a pretty I hope cool so. role. I hope so. <laughs> All right, very cool. And we can do students, bat hands too. There we go. I think we can get that from the classrooms. What do you think? Bats? Raise your hands. Bat hands. If you want There's to ask bat hands. questions. Perfect. There you go. <laughs> All right. And uh, you can follow along with Kristen on Twitter for sure, at Bats for Life, which is pretty cool. Yep. Um, and I'm sure it's probably similar on Instagram. Do you have Instagram? I do. And it's, yep, lots of bats, lots of everything. <laughs> All right. Very cool. Let's start meeting some of our classrooms. So I do want to shout out to uh, Mrs. Gary's class, second graders hanging out with us in Minnesota. They are on uh, YouTube, and I know we have some other students there as well, and I'm going to introduce uh, them shortly. But let's start with Mrs. Metcalf's group. Sixth graders hanging out with us in Salem in the U.S. Let me get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Salem? Hi. All right. My name is Olivia, and my question is, what is the most rare species of bats, and what is being done to save it? Oh yeah, there's so there are some bat species like that one I mentioned on in Australia, the critically endangered uh, southern bentwing bat. Um, so a lot of the bats that live on islands, very small islands like Fiji, um, are critically endangered, which means there's there can be less than a hundred or less than a thousand of them. And so to save them, what we do as bat conservationists is we study them. So we basically try to figure out how many of them there are and what they need to survive. And then we work with the local communities, wherever those bats are, to do conservation work. So that might mean if the bats are living in a cave that's being um, entered by people, that might mean putting up a fence so the people can't go inside the cave and the, it will protect the bats. Um, so it's a lot of work with the local people, wherever, wherever that is and a lot of research too. Great question. All right, let's take another little trip here. Let's go to Flemington, New Jersey. Fifth graders hanging out uh, with Miss Nagy. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing fifth graders? Hi, you two. Hello, you too. Hello mama. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
money. All right, who's up with the question? Um, so have you ever been to Turkey for your bat research? Because Ooh. there are a lot of bats in Turkey. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I've never been to Turkey, but I've been to Hungary. Um, and I've actually gotten to go in some caves in Hungary to look for bats and, uh, and see some bats. But I do want to go to Turkey someday. Great question. All right. We're going to visit with uh, Miss Wafer now. So Miss Wafer is joining us on behalf of her students. So from the Laurel awesome. Springs uh, online education program. So I will let her do a little introduction and then I bet she's got a question or two from some of the students. And I should probably turn her mic on. That would make it easier for her. Uh -oh. <laughs> there we go. Oh, maybe. Um, as way for you have to do it. There, there we go. go. Sorry about that. I was going to do it myself. Um, thank you so much. Great information. I have students from all over the world. Uh, we're a virtual school, so they are in a virtual classroom asking mm -hmm. me questions that I can ask you. Neat. So I have a couple of questions. Two students actually in Michigan. Uh, Sky is in fifth grade, Autumn is in eighth grade. Their questions are about human interaction, which I thought was were interesting questions. Um, Autumn's wondering why humans would kill bats, and Sky is wondering, are bats friendly, and do do you know people like us have interactions with them, or is it mostly scientists like you? Great questions. Um, so yeah. Um, Sometimes people want to kill bats because they're afraid of them. Um, a lot of people don't understand bats because they're out at night. We don't really see them a lot. Like we see birds during the day. Um, and so they're, they're out flying around. But bats are kind of mysterious because we don't get to see them that often. And so I think a lot of people um, fear them when they shouldn't. And because of that, they might try to kill them. Um, if they have bats in their house, they might try to get rid of them. Um, and that's part of being a bat conservationist is working with people to actually um, teach them that bats are not nothing to be afraid of and that they're good to have around. Um, so that's a great question. And then, yeah, everyday interactions. Usually bats, like I said, are out at night. So you're not really going to, to interact with them as a, an everyday person unless you're studying them. Um, sometimes bats do get inside people's houses or you know, their attics and um, they might encounter them that way. But in that case, they are wild animals, so you don't want to touch them because they are, um, they, they can bite just like any other animal. Um, so you'd want to get an adult and they can help get the, get the bat into a box and then have it um, taken outside. But just like any wild animal, we don't wanna go out and, and touch them unless we're studying them, which is why we, we work with them. Great questions. All right, good questions. Let's take a little trip now. Let's go to Montana, Kalispell. We have uh, a couple classes mm -hmm. hanging out with us there with uh, Miss Sinclair. Let me get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Montana? Yeah. Hi. Hi. How do you catch the bats? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I actually have, I'll be right back. I can show you how we actually catch them. So give me one second. So we use what are called mist nets. Um, they're these gigantic nets that are like 30 feet tall. They can be like 60 feet long. And they are, they're really thin nets. So this is what that looks like. So can you, it's kind of hard to see once you have it all out. Can you, can you see that here? It's really hard to see, it's really fine, fine thread. And so what happens is when the bats are flying, they can't see it very well. All bats can see, bats are not blind, but when they're flying really fast at night, they get stuck, they fly into the net and get stuck. And then that's how we, now I'm stuck too. That's how we catch the bats is we come and untangle them and then we study them. So we use these giant mist nets. Great question. All right, great question and a great coincidence that you had the gear just waiting for yes. us. Back out. Laying down. <laughs> All right. Anchorage, Alaska, sixth graders hanging out with Mrs. Miss Carton. Let me get that microphone turned on. There we go. How are we doing, Alaska? How are we doing? Hi. 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 What? Um, what is the largest bat species and how do you measure them? Oh, that's a good question. So the largest bats are one of the flying foxes that I mentioned. Um, 
I think the golden crown flying fox is one of the largest and they have a wingspan of up to six feet. That's taller than I am. So their wingtip to wingtip is six feet, but they only weigh about two pounds. So they're not actually that heavy. And those ones only eat fruit. So they're not out there, you know, eating anything but fruit. Um, and how we study them and how we measure them is we basically use really big rulers um, to, to measure their arms. And then we also use um, scales to measure their weight. So we put them kind of like in a little, we call them bat burritos sometimes if you have like a, a bag and then you wrap it up. And then they, we put them on a scale to weigh their weight. So they're, they're, I've never worked with them, but I heard they're really cool to work with. Great question. All right. Good question. I'm going to take one from online. This is Gary's group. Second graders have sent us in a question. So this is, they've been in caves before uh, where you have to clean your shoes off before walking into the cave. Can you tell them a little bit more about why they had to do that? That is a fantastic question. So when you go into a cave, you can bring things with you from the outside on your clothes, on your shoes and on your hair everywhere. Um, things like fungus, which is why you want to clean off your clothes and your shoes before you enter the cave, because those things like the fungus can make the bats sick. And unfortunately, um, one of the diseases that we have in bats here in the US um, and Canada is white nose syndrome, where the bats get a fungus on them and it grows when they're hibernating and it wakes them up from hibernation in the middle of the winter. So they get really hungry and they fly outside the cave looking for insects in the middle of the winter and there is no food. <clears throat> so they either starve to death or they freeze to death. <clears throat> and so this is a really bad disease. And so that's why we want to protect the bats from things from the outside by cleaning your shoes. Great question. All right, let's visit another one of our camera <clears throat> classrooms. Let's go to Spruce Grove, uh, Alberta today. We've got Ms. Holden, Scott, Looks like a few classrooms hanging out with her. Let's get that mic turned on. What are we doing, Alberta? I'm good. And my question is, what is the life cycle of bats? Ooh, the life cycle. So how long they live or like how the different stages, how long? So that's another superpower of bats is that they're about bat size. So you might think they live two to three to five years like rodents, um, even though they're not rodents they can live up to 40 years or longer in the wild, which is crazy. So actually a lot of scientists are studying bats to figure out is there something in their DNA or in their, um, their body that, can, that we can use to help us live longer and healthier lives? Good question. All right, good question. So uh, just to build on that a little bit with their life cycle, how long uh, do they stay with their parents? Oh, good question. Usually it's about a year. Um, that's that summer. They're born in the summer usually. Um, and the, the baby bat, the mom only has one pup or baby per year for the most part. So they don't have litters like rats and mice do. Um, and so that one baby will stay with the mom for a few months and then they, it learns to fly in about a couple, couple months. And then it flies off. Sometimes the, the groups will stay together. So sometimes those families will actually stay together for years. All right. Really cool. They're very social. This is LeBlanc's fourth and fifth graders are hanging out with us in Canada. Let me get that microphone turned on. How are we doing? Four fives. Hi. Oh, but, I can't hear yeah, can you come a little closer, maybe a little louder? <laughs> if bats aren't blind, why is there a saying blind is blind? Great question. It, it's just one of those sayings that is not true. It's a myth. Um, I think it's because people know that they're out at night. And so people think because they're out at night, they don't need to see. So they don't have eyes, but they actually do. They have eyes, they all can see. Um, but that's one of those myths. Yeah, good question. All right, so I think we can, we've got enough time. We can probably speed round through our classrooms again, but I do want to grab another question from uh, Miss Gary's class. It was an interesting question here. Let me see if I can back up and find it. Oh, okay. Um, they're wondering if there are somewhere you could find like a list of plants that you could plant in your garden that would be good for bats. 
Yes. So um, where where is that? Where are they from? That class? I believe they're in Minnesota. Yeah. Awesome. Minnesota. So um, every state is different, you know, because every state has different plants that grow well. Um, but you should check out the like local Department of Natural Resources or the Wildlife Department in your state to see if they offer any lists of flowers. Uh, for example, here in Georgia, where I am, um, the Department of Natural Resources has a list of noc nocturnal flowers that can attract bats. Um, so check that out, but feel free to email me too um, or on social media and I can help find that information. All right, perfect. Let's start jumping back into our classrooms. Let's start back off in Alberta. Uh, Ms. Holden's group, your mic is on. Hi. Oh, I love your headband. That's great. <laughs> the tail too. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. I have bat ears too. So I, I love that kind of stuff. <laughs> Why are the um, white bats um, like the bats that are these, like, albino? Good question. So they are not albino. They're just white and they have black eyes. So they're, they're not albino. Um, but I think one of the reasons we think that they're white is because they, they roost in the leaves of plants. So like here's a leaf on a plant and they roost up inside of it. And if you're a predator that's looking up, the sky is up here, right? And the sky is usually bright, like white. And so when the bats are in there and they're white, they actually blend into the sky. And so it's hard for the predators to see them. And so it helps them camouflage. So you might not think of white as a camouflage, but in this case it is. So it helps protect them. Great question. All right, heading back to Anchorage. Does our group have another question? Uh, hi. Looks like they're thinking. <laughs> Here comes someone. <laughs> So we had lots of, just out of curiosity as, as part of this, we had a lot of ew, bats and rabies and, and I didn't hear the word rabies come at all. So I'm curious about that, but go ahead and ask your question. Um, um, how do you tell if a bat's a girl or boy and how do they meet, hunt, and how do they mate? And if, and did someone ever came in a Batman costume before? That's a lot of questions. That's a lot of questions. Okay, I think I can do that. <laughs> Let's see, so how can you tell if, a, if they're a boy or a girl? Well, they have the same body parts that we do. So that's one of the things that we do is we look when we find a bat and I can show you here. So we just turn it over and we look to see if they have the genitals of a male or female and that's how we tell. Um, and then also when they're looking for mates, every species is different, but what a lot of bats do is they have these swarms in the fall when they're mating. So they'll all swarm together outside of a cave or where they roost. And that's how they kind of meet each other. It's kind of like a going out to a club and socializing and that's how they find each other. Um, but every bat, every species is different. So there's different ways of, of meeting each other. Um, and then Batman, what was that called? The costume? I've definitely worn a bat costume for sure. And people love Batman. So that's a, a fun thing to do. All right. Good work taking that multiple a uh, load of questions. Let's go to yeah. Miss <laughs> Metcalf's group now. Uh, we'll squeeze another one in from you guys. Uh, my question is, have you ever uh, put a tracker or a tag on a bat? Yes, I have actually. And they, they're these really small trackers, like, I don't know, the size of a pencil tip or the pen tip. Um, and then we actually just glue them on the back of the bat with surgical glue. It's what doctors use to heal wounds on people. Um, so you glue that on, it lasts for a couple weeks usually, and the bat flies away with it, and then we can track it. We can hear the beeps as they fly around. And that's how we actually tell where they go, whether where they're eating and where they're sleeping. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fun to do. Question. All right, let's check in with Ms. Wafer and see if she has another question uh, from the online community. All right, I wanna thank you for answering. Jessime in fourth grade from Mexico was asking about the biggest bat. So you answered that, thank you so much. Awesome, yes. Uh, we're getting <laughs> a lot of questions about what the other person just was, other teacher said rabies uh -huh. and um, other diseases they might carry. And also, I mean, there are myths of course about bats biting people. Yeah. And so they're asking a lot of questions about do they and why would they and those kinds of things. 
Yeah. So, so yes, they can bite just like any wild animal, any dog, cat, anything with teeth can bite when they're threatened, which is why we don't want people to pick them up um, because they can bite. Uh, in terms of rabies and getting sick, um, rabies is actually less than one half of 1% of bats in the wild have rabies. Um, so it's a very low percentage. But if you do find a sick animal on the ground, you know, any animal, it, it's likely to be sick if it's on the ground and acting weird. And that's why you don't wanna touch it. Um, but in general rabies, we don't have rabies here in the United States. Um, it, it's in Mexico and South um, of Mexico. Uh, so we don't have any, or sorry, we do have um, vampire bats um, in Mexico. We do have rabies in the US, but not vampire bats. And vampire bats are the ones that feed on blood. Um, and so the vampire bats, like I said, um, there's three species of vampire bats in the world. And they usually eat things like birds. They usually prey on livestock. So things like cattle and sheep, um, not so much people, but they can um, because they do need blood to survive. But we don't have any vampire bats in the US. So yeah, it's a great question. All right, Ms. LeBlanc's class, your microphone is on again. <laughs> is it true that you can spread the coronavirus? Did you say that again? Sorry, it broke up. Is it true that bats can spread the coronavirus? So I'm, I am not a virus expert, um, so I don't wanna say yes or no, but they can carry diseases like viruses, um, which is why people are studying them so much. So it, it is, could be that they do carry that and spread it, um, but that's a really good point that we actually are studying bats about why they can carry viruses and not get sick themselves. And we're trying to learn how they actually um, can do that and not get sick. And so how can we use that to, to help our immune systems? Yeah, good question. All right, good question and very topical. Yeah. Uh, Montana, Miss Sinclair's group, your microphone is on. Hi. Um, I've heard that some fish go blind after a while after they've been in the dark. I was wondering if they, if that's how they develop um, echolocation. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, those, so those cave fish that are only in the, the caves and they only live there, yeah, they, they have over time lost the sight, lost vision. Um, and so bats, we don't really know exactly how they developed um, echolocation, but one of the reasons is because they are out at night. And so they still need their eyes to see because they are also out during the day sometimes. Um, but when it's really dark, it's, it is hard to see. So that echolocation helps them see even better. And another reason uh, to develop echolocation is because they're flying through really um, kind of tight areas. They're flying through trees. Um, and it's, it's really hard to keep up when you're flying and see all that at night. So the echolocation helps them to navigate and find prey. That's a really cool question. Yeah. All right. And let's take another trip to Ms. Nagy's group. Your microphone is on. Um, Hi. Have you ever gotten bitten by a vet? <laughs> I've gotten bitten once. Um, we always wear gloves when we handle bats, live bats, because um, like I said, they can bite. Um, so I've only really been bitten like once. Um, the bats that I handle are pretty small though, so they can't really get through the gloves that I wear, which is why we wear them. All right. And a final question I think worth asking is <clears throat> where could classrooms go if they want to look for a good design for a bat? Ooh, for a bat house? Yeah. yeah. Um, so on the internet, Bat Conservation International actually has um, plans online where you, it gives step-by-step -step instructions of how to build bat, different types of bat houses. Um, and also there's several organizations, Habitat for Bats and Bat Conservation and Management also have kits. Um, and that's the, the bat house that I showed earlier where they have pre-assembled kits and all you do is put the kit together. Um, and they're really easy to build and they're great for classes. So I'd recommend both of those and BCI for plans. All right, perfect. Well, I'm gonna start with a huge thank you to our YouTube classrooms, to our live on camera classrooms. Very well thought out questions today. Good job, boys and girls. <laughs> uh, Kristen, thank you so much for being with us, for sharing your passion for bats Absolutely. and bat conservation with us. And uh, yeah, hopefully one day we can do one from the field because that would be fun. I know, I hope so too. Yep. All right. Thanks everyone, you have great questions. Very cool. So Kristen, Bye. if you could stick around for just a moment after we end, okay. uh, 
class in Alaska are going to get a selfie with you. They love to do a selfie. Oh, awesome. We'll keep you for just a moment, but get those bats up, boys and girls. I'm turning on the microphones. Let's get nice and loud. A big goodbye and thank you. All right. Awesome work, everybody. Thanks so much for hanging out today. Uh, lots of events coming up next week. We hope to see your classrooms again. So we are signing off for today.